welcome and thank you for attending this evening. My name is Elliot Perry and I come wearing many hats. One, I'm a former NBA player, minority owner of the Memphis Grizzlies, along with a couple of other people in this room, Pitt Hyde and my former teammate, Anthony Hardaway, chair of the Grizzlies Foundation, but we've decided to use sports to shape young men by mentoring them and helping them gain a different perspective by using our experiences and also a member of the National Civil Rights Museum Board. But most important, I am a Memphian, tried and true, born and raised. We took the tour in, in 1968, March 28th, Dr. King led a, for the uh, sanitation workers, a march for the sanitation workers. And there was a man that walked right across the picture of an Ernest Withers photograph. And that man gazing into the camera was my grandfather. And one year later to the day, March 28, 1969, I was born. And I remember in the late 70s, I would take the pilgrimage from Mason Temple to the National Civil Rights Museum on April 4th. Being a young kid, I never understood why until I asked my grandfather one day. And a man with a fourth or fifth grade education, nothing in academics, he said, son, when your turn comes, you just do your part. And so with that, I've always tried to give my time, my talent, and my treasure. But more importantly, most of you are doing the same thing. And I want to personally say that I appreciate all of your time, all of your talents, and all of your treasures that you give, helping shape our communities all across this nation. So thank you for that. It is also my pleasure to introduce Michelle Roberts, the Executive Director of the NBA Players Association. Ms. Roberts is the first woman to head a major professional sports union in North America. You're talking about breaking down boundaries. <laughs> Absolutely. In her role, she is the primary advocate for all players, ensuring the protection of its membership including serving as the lead negotiator in, all, ne negotiator in all collective bargaining activities. Prior to that, she was a renowned trial lawyer. I think I've heard it said that she was the finest pure trial lawyer in Washington, D.C. <laughs> what a tremendous accomplishment. <laughs> but before I hand the mic over to Ms. Roberts, and thank you for being here, Ms. Roberts, I would like to acknowledge a very generous gift to the National Civil Rights Museum in honor of MLK 50. A gift collectively made by the NBA, the NBA Players Association, the Los Angeles Lakers, and the Memphis Grizzlies. A $100,000 donation. <laughs> and so for that, we are truly grateful on behalf of the board of the National Civil Rights Museum and its staff and our community. Thank you, Commissioner Silk. Thank you, Jeannie Buss of the Los Angeles Lakers, Jason Weckler of the Memphis Grizzlies, and also Michelle Roberts of the NBPA for your contribution. So please help me welcome Michelle Roberts to the stage. Thank you, and, and I will be brief because th that's kind of my MO. Um, let me say that it is a, a rule that I go by. Um, my rule is that I never, ever give off any potential information about how old I am in public. Um, but I'm going to break that rule today because unlike Elliot, and I think most of the people in this room, I was actually alive uh, when Martin Luther King was killed. Uh, in fact, I remember that day fairly vividly. Um, I was in my apartment in New York, in the apartment that I grew up in with my family. Uh, one of my mother's best friends uh, lived in one of the apartments on the same floor. Her name was Miss Dolores. And I remember that night um, 
Miss Dolores came to our apartment and she was banging on the door. And when my mom let her in, it was, it was clear that Miss Dolores was unbelievably upset about something. And she said to my mother, she said, Elsie, Elsie, they killed him. And my mother said, killed who? And I remember she said, Miss Dolores said two words. She said, Dr. King. Now, my mother was, I'll, I'll describe her as a fairly stoic woman. Um, she, she rarely uh, showed raw emotions. But I remember that night, after Ms. Dolores said, Dr. King, I saw in my mother something I had not ever seen before. She said, you know, word to the effect, Jesus, no. And then she started to sob. I was 11 or 12, I think I was 12 at that time, and I, I remember being terrified. And it wasn't because Dr. King had been killed, because I'll be honest and tell you, at that time, I did not know much about Dr. King. We didn't have a Black History Month back then. We didn't have black studies in our schools. I had a, a passing knowledge that there was this guy, this reverend in the South that my mom seemed to think was important. So I wasn't frightened because he had been killed. What frightened me was I did not know who this man was that had evoked such an incredible reaction from my mother, a reaction I'd never seen. And at that moment, I made it my business to learn everything and anything I could about him. It, it wasn't long when I came to realize why my mother and why Ms. Dolores were so heartbroken about his killing, because I learned how much of a contribution he had made to our community. You know, being in that, on that balcony today was kind of tough for me, um, but I'm glad I came. Because as we all know, that's hallowed ground. And as I was standing there, I was wishing I could, I could just pray and, and, and thank Dr. King and let him know that the world is perfect because of his contribution and the contribution of so many others. But that's not a prayer we can, we can, we can indulge in these days. We've come a long way, but we have such a long, 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 long way to go. So let's get started. And let's get started with the aptly entitled panel, MLK 50. Where do we go from here? Take it away, Don. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Robert. As a member of the museum board, I am proud of what we get done here on a daily basis. And we can credit that to our president, Terry Freeman. In 2014, Terry took over the reins of the National Civil Rights Museum to help us refocus, reshape, and take us to our next iteration of what the museum is about. Prior to that, for 18 years, Ms. Freeman served as the president of the Community Foundation in Washington, D.C., the largest funder of nonprofit organizations in the metropolitan area. In that position, she distinguished herself <coughs> for her community building, her leadership on critical issues to improve our community, and also she increased the foundation's assets from 52 million to over 350 million. But at the National Civil Rights Museum, she has served as a catalyst for taking us into our next iteration, like I said before, shaping the idea of where do we go from here? We realized what happened. We know what's happening now. Now where do we go from here? By leading tremendous conversations and taking the organization outside in and then bringing in some of the most tough and having some of the most toughest conversations right here in this building, not just about social issues, race and religion, but also about gender, about jobs, and about police brutality. And that we've never had. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Terry, for 
leading this museum, and we are so proud to have you as our president. Help me welcome Terry Freeman. <laughs> Right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's good to see everyone out there. Now, I'm going to try not to squint and not look in these lights. And to our panelists, I'm sorry, Mike, that I'm behind you. So okay. just you can glance back, and then you can pay attention to the audience when, when, I, when I ask you a question. We, we are thrilled to have you here. Thank you, Elliot, for that very generous introduction. And let me echo um, Elliot in thanking you for that incredible gift to the National Civil Rights Museum. It always means a lot, but in this 50th year, it is that much more important that we are able to continue uh, not to focus on what happened on April 4th, 1968, but to talk about the legacy that was left and frankly, the work that we have to do. So let me just say that we are pleased to partner with the Grizzlies uh, to host this forum, uh, an opportunity to talk about the intersection of race, sport, and social justice. This is our fourth annual forum and it promises not to disappoint. So let's introduce our panelists. Mike Conley is in his 10th MBA season. Mike Conley Jr. has emerged as one of the pr premier point guards in the NBA with an impressive list of accomplishments. Early in the 2016-17 season, Conley Jr. became the Grizzlies' all-time leader in points, assists, and steals. Not only does he excel on the court, Mike is a role model off the court. Taking home the NBA Sportsmanship Award in 2014 and the NBA Community Assist Award in January 2016. Mike's generosity and his dedication to creating access to opportunity through philanthropy make him a thoughtful voice on issues of social justice. A native of Indiana, he is all Memphian now, Mike Conley. <laughs> Seated next to Mike is Swin Cash. Swin is a five-time WNBA All-Star, two-time WNBA All-Star MVP, and three-time WNBA champion, or as I like to call her, a boss. <laughs> Recently honored by the WNBA as one of the top 20 greatest and most influential players in the league, in league history, she is the founder of Cash Building Blocks, an affordable housing development company, and Cash for Kids, a nonprofit that helps young people better understand fitness, leadership, and service. And I might add, she is also a Freedom Award winner. Uh, so we welcome Swin Cash. Seated next to Swin is Mark Philpart. Mark is a senior director at PolicyLink. He has deep expertise and experience in advancing race and gender equity. He is responsible for shaping and cultivating efforts that build the political power and voice of the most marginalized and vulnerable in communities throughout the country. A nationally recognized leader in the equity movement, Mark also has deep relationships with community leaders throughout the country, often working with them to advance policy proposals that remove barriers and create opportunities for their residents. In his nine years at PolicyLink, he has contributed to the passage of over 100 bills into law in his native state of California. Mark. And Brooke Lopez, a self-described California guy, Brooke Lopez was born in Los Angeles, grew up in Fresno, California, and played college ball at Stanford in Northern California. One of the most dominant centers in the NBA, he is back home now playing for the Los Angeles Lakers, a member of police activity leagues growing up, and a believer in the positive role basketball plays in the lives of youth in poverty. Brooke continues to support police activity leagues organizations across the state. Brooke, thank you for being here with us. This year, as we are commemorating the 50th anniversary of that tragic assassination of Dr. King, 
We want our panel to examine the legacy question that Dr. King left with us. Where do we go from here? In his final book of the same name, Dr. King implored us to go beyond civil rights to a focus on human rights. He wrote, and I quote, let us be dissatisfied until the tragic walls that separate the outer city of wealth and comfort and the inner city of poverty and despair shall be crushed. Let us be dissatisfied until every family is living in a decent sanitary home. Let us be dissatisfied until the dark yesterday of segregated schools will be transformed into bright tomorrow's of quality education. Let us be dissatisfied until integration is not seen as a problem, but as an opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. Let us be dissatisfied. Basically, King says to us to continue to fight for justice and equity for all. Be concerned with a growing wealth gap. Be concerned with separate and unequal educational opportunities. Be concerned when diversity is seen as more of a detriment than an asset. So with that, I ask our panelists to think about that question. And Swin, I'd like to start with you. Do Dr. King's words, you a boss, so you can handle it. <laughs> Do Dr. King's words ring true to you and how satisfied or not are you with our progress? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, does his words ring true? Absolutely. Since I was a, a little girl, I can recall uh, my grandmother who grew up in the civil rights movement, um, always speaking about Dr. King and about uh, what my cousins and I could be or what we would have in life. And she was constantly pouring into us. She was constantly praying for us and believing that our country, our world would be better, a better place for, for my cousins and I. And I still believe that. I still believe that there are people that do the work every day um, who want to see the complete dream of Dr. King fulfilled. But are we there yet? Absolutely not. I think if we're being honest with ourselves, it is a constant work in progress. It's like, um, organically always shifting and changing, um, understanding where the goal is, but sometimes the goalpost is moving on us. And uh, we have to be strong enough and use our voice enough, use our vote enough to try to get to that end place, that, that ultimate goal that I think everyone in this room really wants. Um, but like I said, we're, we're not there yet. It's a work in progress. And the question, I guess to answer the question of how we're gonna get there. Um, it's what every single person in this room doing their part in their neighborhood to create a change. And I truly believe that we can one day. And if we don't have hope, then what do we really have? Mike, let me ask you the same question there. Do you think that Dr. King's words ring true and how satisfied or not are you with the progress? Well, I, I agree with Swen. I think his words do ring true. Um, as far as being dis dissatisfied, I think um, none of us are satisfied with the state we're in today. Sorry, I look over you like this is kind of hard. <laughs> Suit's kind of tight. But, uh, <clears throat> well, well, then you keep yeah, I'll look way. forward. <laughs> um, but, you know, in all honesty, just, yeah, I saw a stat the other day that said, um, you know, 1% of the world's population has more wealth than the other 99%. And when you think of things like that, it, it, blows your, it blows your mind completely. You know, how can we be living in a world satisfied with our daily life um, when you have a whole, the majority of the world living in a, in a state that is, is, not, is not satisfactory? And um, when you think about here in Memphis, child poverty rates are high, unemployment's high. All these things are still a problem, are still an issue uh, today. And it's been 50 years since Dr. King gave his, gave his speech. And, and did what he did here in Memphis. So um, it's, it's nothing to be satisfied about, a lot of work to be done. Um, but like Swen alluded to, it's all of our responsibility, um, especially us in, in positions that we are in, with the platform that we have, 
uh, to try to make a stand and make change um, and be you know, activists in the same sense. Brooke, what about your thoughts on, on that same question? Yeah, um, I, I agree completely. You know, obviously, uh, you know, if you, if you look in the society today or, or at the news today, uh, Dr. King's words are as relevant as they ever have been, you know, if not more, honestly. It's, it's, um, it's uh, truly amazing to look uh, back at the time he was in and see how his words still affect us today um, in 2018. And, uh, you know, he just... Uh, Kind of have to take a look, and, and like Swin said, you know, the goalpost may have moved. You know, it's very true that it might not be the exact same conditions, but we're still fighting the same overall issue. And uh, a lot of that, again, like Mike said, takes into account people who have access and people who are in fortunate positions to giving back to their community and not just not just through philanthropy or money, but really going back into the community and actually taking accountability. You know, it, it's not about just sitting up here and, and having a dialogue, but, you know, really taking the fact that, you know, I can do my part, Mike can do his part, someone can do her part, and for every person in this room, standing up and being accountable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mark, I know uh, much of the work of PolicyLink focuses around economic equity. This issue of the wealth gap in our, well, we could say world, but we'll focus on the country. Um, in your estimation, how do we turn our dissatisfaction into action to begin to shrink the wealth gap? Yes, thank you. The the issue of the wealth gap is one that I think is has been around for forever. And when we think about uh, the state of people of color in our country, I think we have to be thinking not only about uh, wealth and income, but the situation that people find themselves in communities. Uh, more likely, uh, people of color find themselves in concentrated poverty in urban communities. Uh, and concentrated poverty is the kind of poverty that is stifling. It has a stranglehold on people's ability to uh, really reach opportunity at all. Uh, it includes things like failing schools, communities that are over-policed, um, and a lack of access to jobs and economic development opportunities. And so when I think about you know, what can be done to close the wealth gap, I think it really is about community transformation. Uh, it really is about um, all the things that go into ensuring people have access to quality jobs that uh, provide enough for people to sustain families. Uh, and too often we don't think about those things. Uh, too often uh, Americans are shorted on quality of, of work, um, the, the amount they can earn at a job, and even having access to the networks that can get them a job. You think about your first job, it was probably through someone you knew, uh, at least for me, that was the case. And oftentimes when you grow up in a neighborhood that's isolated, um, that is just stifled by poverty, you don't have those networks and those opportunities. Yeah, I think people don't realize the isolation that takes place for communities that find themselves marginalized and the impact that that has on their lives. <clears throat> and there's data that actually uh, say that people who are in marginalized communities actually suffer at a higher level of PTSD. Um, and so when we think about what our veterans experience, we have people in our communities who are experiencing that on a daily basis as well. We're going to come back and have you talk a little bit more about um, economic equity. Um, but Brooke, I wanted, I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, education. Uh, you know, King talks about the lack of access to quality education. Those were his words, not mine. For all students, uh, many young people view athletics as their way out and up. But can you talk about the importance of athletics in creating or providing access to education? Yeah, um, you know, I can uh, obviously speak to my personal experience. You know, growing up in my family, um, there were four of us boys, you know, four, four big boys, you know, athletically inclined. But, um, you know, with my mom raising us as she was, she was a single mom, a public teacher, uh, raising us all on her salary. Uh, she put books first every time, you know, and uh, 
she, she worked her way to graduating from Stanford. She went to Stanford. And so from, from very young, it was instilled in us that uh, we needed an education if we wanted to do anything or amount to anything. Um, and so w with her inspiration and her guidance and, uh, you know, each of us brothers looking out for each other as well, um, we, we were able to get, up, get to where we needed to go, I should say, you know, get, get through high school, get to Stanford, and, uh, and um, become what we are today. But, you know, what I'm getting at is that that foundation I had, that family foundation I had was so key to me and so key to my experience. And when you look a lot of, uh, at a lot of situations that we uh, spoke upon, it's having that, uh, that sort of safety net, those people you can go to and realizing that, that uh, they're there for you and then having that accessibility. You know, obviously I was able to uh, reach out to my mom whenever I needed to and uh, she really looked out for me and was a huge role model in what I did. So when I know that you have cash for kids and you really focus on fitness and leadership development, can you talk a little bit about how you look at athletics and it's providing a path for education? Yeah, and, and I want to also add something to what Brooke was saying and just kind of make it more of a reality for everybody that's, that's in here. Um, with the kids that I work with in my organization, we have kids that um, are athletically inclined and you look at them and some AAU coach probably will walk up and be like you are the next Mike Conley you are the next Brooke Lopez and that's how they look at these kids sometimes but I look at these kids and I talk to them about basketball and about sports and about using the game and not letting the game use you and what do I mean by that uh, basketball has afforded me to be where I am today basketball helped me get a scholarship to the University of Connecticut because I was bouncing that ball every single day thinking about how am I getting out of public housing how am I having a better life and I knew that I could dribble the ball I knew that I could do things with the ball that other people couldn't do and somebody was going to give me a free education and so when I speak to kids I use I meet them where they are. And a lot of times kids need to know, not that you're just gonna give them money, but you're gonna help them have a tool that's gonna make their life better. And so a lot of times people just throw money at things and you don't realize you're throwing money to go buy jerseys and for them to play basketball, but are you teaching them something while playing basketball? And that's the fact that I love with Cash for Kids that I can walk into a gym now and we just partner with the recreation center where I grew up at in public housing because I wanted to have a place where some of the kids that we work with who aren't getting a meal at night and have to get up to go to school the next day that I could figure out a way to say, you know what, we could open up the gym and have basketball, but I know that there's a way I can give these kids a free meal somehow. And those are the things that I constantly think about is how can we make the life better so that they can go to school and want to study and be focused? Teachers get mad sometimes with kids and don't realize that their stomach's hurting because they don't have food in us. Um, but, you know, they go to gym class and they're not, they don't have energy to run around because they're hungry. So these are the realities of things that we have to deal with. But I think using sports is a way to get kids sometimes in the door. And once they're in the door, we teach them all the other things that they need to know to try to help them better their life. Do you want to add anything to that, Mike? I'd like to go before her next time. <laughs> <laughs> her, her answers are fantastic. <laughs> I, I told you I'm, I'm not saying anything else. I'm <laughs> done. I'll, I'll so keep I'm that like, in mind for the, for, for the next question. But do you want to add anything? Um, it, I, mine's, uh, I'll be brief. It, it, my, my, I was lucky enough to have uh, both my parents in my life, and um, they were both role models for me. Uh, my father was an athlete. Uh, he ran track and, and was in the Olympics, and um, and he instilled in me really at a young age of the 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 process it takes to to be great at whatever you want to be at, whether that is education, school, books, track, basketball, whatever it is. And um, I took it to heart and and really um, didn't want to fail him more than anybody. You know, fail my parents, and and that kind of mindset um, I think allowed me to to have a different kind of outcome than a lot of other guys who are bigger, faster, stronger, better than me at any at sports, smarter, smarter than me as well. Um, and, you know, thankfully I was just able to have that kind of a foundation, like Brooke was saying, about having a good family atmosphere.
Okay. So we've talked about the environment that some of these young people are growing up in, but frankly, all of us are kind of having to deal with an interesting environment uh, today, an environment that surrounds these issues of economic equity, education, and diversity. Some say there is a clear normalizing of hate, racism, racial violence, and sexism. This is illustrated by the protest in Charlottesville and the unfortunate pervasiveness of inappropriate and aggressive behavior toward women as highlighted by the Me Too movement. Do you think we are becoming numb to these issues? Do you think that it actually is being normalized? And Mike, I'm going to let you start. Hey. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I wasn't ready, but, um, you know, I, I, you know, racism, hatred, all these things that are occurring today and we consider, um, numbing or normal um, it didn't just become normal for a lot of people in their lives I thought I think this is something that people have been experiencing for a very long time um, unfortunately and you know with the events in Charlottesville uh, for me personally it, it was a sad it was a sad time and a sad day to see uh, something like that going on just mainly because I was thinking about the people that came before all of us, all the people who sacrificed, gave the ultimate sacrifice for us to even be on the stage we're at today. And we have a long way to go, but we got here because of people before us and their dream wasn't to see what was going on in Charlottesville happening. And, and I know all of us standing, sitting in this room are, are probably think that same way. I mean, and it, and it, was, it was an awful feeling. So um, it is almost more of a call, call to action, you know, for, for, for me personally. Um, basically saying if you, you we have to stand up now uh, otherwise we'll be condemning you know the, our future generations to the same thing so Brooke any thoughts on this this kind of atmosphere where if you think it it just you just say it if you feel it you just say it and the environment in which we find ourselves today yeah um, it, it's uh, it's definitely unfortunate absolutely unfortunate that uh, it has in a way become normal in that it occurs so regularly now. You see these uh, these things being said by you know people as high up as our president that are just so out of line, you know, and, and just uh, mind blowing. Frankly, that um, you, you see you see it happen so often that people see that, and it's coming from you know people like our head of state, and it seems okay in that regard. And it does create that sense of normalizing. And, you know, um, I think Mike's comment about it, it being a sort of call to arms is definitely such a, um, obvi an obvious silver lining of that, is people standing up and saying, no, this isn't right. You know, we have to use our platform to, make, to take a stance. And for instance, uh, I think, you know, you can look at the counter protest in Charlottesville, uh, in peaceful protests in general, in the vein of Gandhi and Dr. King. Um, peaceful protests that, uh, that don't use hateful rhetoric, that want to come to that understanding um, of equality, a true equality, and uh, again, just understanding one another. So, so Mark, you know, there is this kind of, there is an attitude sometimes that you have to fight fire with fire. Um, but what kinds of resistance to this type of, I call it ignorance and rhetoric, bring you optimism? You know, I think it's what Brooke said. When you think about um, how people are responding, how people are standing up in ways that are unifying, in ways that are peaceful, in ways that are loving, in ways that really uphold our values, um, that to me is what is inspirational. It's, it's that response to the racism, to the patriarchy, to the misogyny that I think is really gonna be what takes us into the, into the future. The, the big challenge is we have to be able to expose these atrocities in ways that not only call them out for what they are, but 
pull people in to a way of being with one another so that we can move forward in a united fashion. Um, and it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, I struggle with it myself because I'm quick to identify someone or something as the enemy. Um, and to not approach the situation with an embrace or greater understanding that, that you know, a lot of what Dr. King talked about in his speeches was about love um, and the beloved community. Um, and he understood that, you know, racism was a disease and it infected everyone. Um, and there were a lot of people who were benefiting from it, but at the same time, he saw people as being sick and wanting to heal them and cure them. And that's a big man, you know, <laughs> uh, because it's so very easy to fall into a space where you are castracizing and calling people out and, you know, putting them in a space where they are the enemy versus, you know, a potential ally, a potential comrade someone who can make change with you. Um, I'm not saying all of that to say don't protect yourself, <laughs> um, but, but I do think um, there is a conversation to be had about how we can reconcile. So, Swin, so uh, thinking about that from the perspective of kind of what we've been seeing in the news of late with regard to the misogyny and, in fact, violence on, on women, um, what do you think are the ways that we resist this and we move forward? Well, I think I think women are just tired of being sick and tired. I, I, I think um, <laughs> everything that's that's happening now has just been done for so many years. And usually, you what women used to do is you would be at work and you would see the new girl or somebody come in and you would pull her to the side to make sure certain things didn't happen to her and you just kept it amongst yourselves. But my grandma used to always say the boogeyman at some point comes out of the closet. So now America has the boogeyman out of the closet. So what are you gonna do about it? Um, and I think it starts with having conversations. I think it starts with changing policies um, at the workplace um, and I think now companies have to be held to a higher standard of protecting not only women, but also men. I mean, women sometimes don't like when I say this, but whenever things start spiraling and it goes all the way in one direction, it's hard because now men don't want to have a conversation and they're scared if I say one thing. You know, I had a friend of mine, and I'll just give this example, I had a friend of mine who said, you know what, I love shoes, and sometimes I compliment a woman at work for her shoes. I'm scared, should I say anything now? And this is a highly intelligent person who takes care of a lot of people's money and he's like <laughs> nervous to like ask me that question, but I use that example to say is that we have to start having conversations and understanding how we can change things but not make everyone so completely uncomfortable, men and women. Um, and I think that's one thing that we can do, change, change policies at workplaces, start having conversations so people understand what's acceptable. If you don't know, you should know by now. Mm -hmm. And if you make that mistake, then you're gonna have to deal with the consequences. I think secondly, yes, let's clap for that. All the women in here, yeah. Um, and I think secondly, um, I just wanna say that I think, I think we're at a very difficult time very difficult time that we need to stop sugarcoating things and call them for what they are. A lie is a lie. Racism is racism. Bigotry is bigotry. And I think, and so on and so on. And I, and I say this to say, I just remember being in school. I think we all can remember being in school. In our institutions, whether it was the presidency, whether it was the principal's office, whatever it is, you knew that it held a certain standard that if I got called to the principal's office or I heard something on television, like I could pretty much understand that that was gonna be truth to an extent, especially from certain institutions. We're at a place now where it's very difficult mm -hmm. for kids, sometimes you don't wanna turn on the television because you don't want all of the, the lies and misdirections to be poured into your kids. And I think we consistently say to people, especially minorities who are marginalized in so many ways in this country, that we have to be the ones that have to change or help other people who don't like us or like the color of our skin 
to help them understand us better. And it just becomes a point where we have to start, the people who want to understand or get educated, those are the people that we have to start trying to create change with. And for those people who don't like you, who don't understand you, I'm not saying that you can't love them, you can't pray for them, but you can't consistently keep beating your head up against the brick wall and the change is not happening. So I think we're just at a point where we have to start making some decisions of who are the people in your circle that you want to be around. And I, and I do think that who are the people in your circle who can be influenced? Yes, absolutely. Um, because I think that we do have to all work together. And it's not about necessarily ideology as much as it is about what is leadership? And what does leadership mean? And if we think on the ideals of Dr. King and a message that says, you know, hate is too hard, it's too difficult. So we're going to err on the side of love. And so we have to be able to do that. Let's, let's talk a little bit about um, what we're seeing today. Um, how would you all compare the movement of the past, the, the 20th century civil rights movement, as I describe it, to the 21st century activism that we are seeing right now. Um, Mike, let's start with you. Well, uh, I found it interesting just taking the tour today that the, the movement back in the day, a lot of the people that were involved in it were young, really, really young. 18 to 24, I think, was the age, age group that you saw. Um, <coughs> I, I'm be the first to admit, I'm, I've become more aware and more um, more, more, more of a sense to a calling as I've gotten older and more mature, but when I was 18 and 24, I can't tell you if I was thinking about that. You know, I, I don't know if you guys would agree, but I don't know if th that was what I was willing to do or be, you know, willing to sacrifice. And you're talking about back then, people were risking their lives every day. And today, it's, I think you, you've got a similar, a similar type of uh, uh, activist, but um, like I said, I think it was more of a younger crowd in which they really understood the meaning of what they were trying to go after when it's more today you got a lot more mature older people or let's say older I'm 30 but um, you know you got you got a, a different age group of people that um, are more aware of it than I think our young community is can you address that a little bit yeah um, I, I agree with Mike completely um, you know when he first mentioned uh, he was surprised and shocked at how young these, uh, these gentlemen were who were doing what they were doing back in the 60s uh, during the original civil rights movement. Um, you know, I have to go back and think, it, uh, think about myself when I was learning about the civil rights movement. And uh, you know, obviously I was a kid at that point, and so these, these uh, definitely seemed like you know, older gentlemen to me. But looking at them now uh, and being people younger than you know, a, a lot of us up here um, is very uh, amazing to me, and um, I, I think, uh, like Mike said, you know, you see uh, a lot of older people uh, asserting themselves, and, and you have the uh, feminist marches and stuff like that. Well, uh, you see uh, a lot on college campuses too, people really taking uh, their unions they have on campus and coming together, young people coming together and making change. Uh, on a collegiate level uh, throughout the U.S. as well. This year, at, or at the end of uh, 2017, the Commercial Appeal named community activists in Memphis as the persons of the year because of what they were able to accomplish. And I think, in actuality, while sometimes it can be hard for us to try to compare the 20th century movement to the 21st century movement, there are so many similarities, so many similarities, youth being a, a, a part of it, and even the methods that are used that, that are also very similar. Um, so I do see activism as having, uh, it, it's, it's certainly um, in full effect is, is what I would say. Mark? Yes, just to add to this, because you know, I, I think there are, as you say, a lot of similarities. Um, you look at the demands um, that Dr. King was making through the Poor People's Campaign, and uh, which are very similar to what the Black Panthers were asking for um, as part of their 10-point platform. Um, and you contrast that to today, I mean, those things are still very, very relevant. And in fact, Dr. 
uh, or Reverend Barber um, is launching a poor people's campaign that is asking for all the same stuff. But when I think about all the, the distinctions, um, I think young people have so many more distractions mm -hmm. these days. I think there's just, there's, there's so much pulling uh, a young person in any given direction at any time. Um, I think it makes it hard for them to be focused on the most salient issues of the day. I think technology has definitely changed the way that uh, we talk about movements um, in the same way that the television kind of played a role in, in uh, the civil rights movement. I feel like we're in the Twitterverse now and uh, you know, you have to work hard to avoid it, you know, <laughs> and it's like, and, it, and, and not being on Twitter is kind of, you're kind of shunned. Um, it's, it's a weird thing where, you know, movements are kind of captured in, in that space within 140 characters. Um, and then when I, when I think about another distinction, I think about the professionalization of, uh, of the, the movement. And back then in the civil rights movement, you know, people were doing this, you know, kind of voluntarily, you know, they were, they were, you know, taking time off of their jobs. They were doing things after work or before work. Now it's actually a profession to be an advocate, to be an organizer. Um, and, and that's the kind of infrastructure and uh, uh, oomph that just wasn't present back then. And so I think now there's so much more capacity. Um, it's hard to know what to do with it. Uh, but I think that presents a really unique opportunity for us as we think about how to, how to, how to really get what we want um, from the perspective of you know, creating a more just and equitable society. So you, so, sure. Quick? Um, a couple of things that I noticed about that as well is I think social media, and you talked about Twitter, but not only Twitter, I think yeah, Facebook. My questions. Oh, oh sorry. I've <laughs> already had to flip because Mark answered, answered the question sorry. that I didn't ask. Now, Swim, go I'll, let you, I'll let you go. go. No, go okay. right ahead. I, I was just going to say that one of the things that I noticed is, um, and um, obviously I'm not as young as, as Brooke and, and um, Mike, but I'm not old either. I'm seasoned, as women like to say. Uh, but I've noticed that my kind of generation and, and even into millennials now that social media is how they mobilize. And it's not just only Twitter, it's also Facebook, you have certain groups. Um, I think that is where a lot of the power lies for them, whereas it's not only just finding out stuff here in our country, if something's happening overseas, immediately you're finding out about it, groups are talking about it, uh, even when the Women's March happened, you started seeing Women's March that was happening in London and in different countries. I mean, that is, that's powerful stuff to be able to do that. I think back to Dr. King and, and back then the Civil Rights Movement, if they had just that access, um, his voice alone, people were just kind of captivated by it and his speeches, I mean, to be able to project that out, um, just think about how much more change could have occurred. So that's what I think about um, there. And I think the other thing for me too is women, we think about women from the civil rights movement and even young women now that are kind of taking their place and having certain platforms, um, they're starting to make the change. I was blessed enough to spend um, a lunch with uh, Dr. Dorothy Height when I was um, in DC before, you know, God rest her soul, she passed away. And it was amazing to just learn some of the things from back then that women, you know, we were standing behind trying to support the voice of the different men that were uh, coming forth throughout the movement, whereas now women are saying, no, we're going to mobilize together and be able to, to get an agenda. So, I mean, I think that's very fascinating. So I'm going to ask my question anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> Black, Black Lives Matter actually began as a hashtag, right? And it was a hashtag that was formed by three African-American women. And it grew into a very powerful political force. My question was, and you touched on it, but I want you all to touch on the other side too. Social media, how does it impact activism on the positive side and or the negative side? So. Mike, let me go to you uh, on that. Um, well, I think social media as a whole um, can be very powerful, like we all just alluded to, especially to, towards this subject, when you given the fact that you can have access to so much knowledge, so much um, news across the world, um, you are aware of things uh, a lot quicker and allows you to be, 
I would say, I guess it, it allows you to be up to date. It allows you to, to connect with others quicker. It allows you to uh, put yourself in different places that you want to be involved in, whether it, it be in your in your city. Twitter works in, in small communities still. Even in Memphis, you can use Twitter, Instagram, whatever, and you can meet at a place and you can have a march. You can, you know, go on strike. You can do all these things basically off of a, a social media platform. And, um, and thankfully enough, we have that. And, and at the same time, you know, social media isn't all good, and we know that. You know, there's so many things that are why social media is dangerous um, for all the other reasons. That's how you know, a lot of the terrorists and all the other things, they, they communicate and do things through these, these kind of forms too, and, and domestically as well. I mean, it's not all um, you know, rose-colored lenses, but um, I look at the positive in it, and, um, and I think that you know, social media can really um, be even utilized even more. Brooke, how do you see the impact of social media on movements today? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think the positives uh, outweigh the negatives. You know, obviously, like Mike said, that there's a lot of negatives. You know, obviously, in comment sections, on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever, you know, people spewing hate uh, and, and fear-mongering and all sorts of things um, in, comment section, in comment sections. It's, it's very uh, depressing, disappointing stuff, and it... Um, it, it really makes a kind of really paints a, a dark face on things it makes things look bleak but then you see a, a lot of positive things as well uh, uh, it ra definitely raises awareness um, it uh, brings you up to date on news and, and like Mike said just setting up setting up marches setting up a uh, whatever sort of uh, protests you may want to set up and uh, just bringing people together and people can realize out there, hey, I'm not alone in this. I'm not alone in believing this. There's other people like me and, and obviously we're strongest when we're together. Mm -hmm. You know, it is um, interesting when you do kind of compare and contrast the fact that King used television, which was the new medium, and how effectively he did use that medium. So as you say, if he had had social media at his, right. at his disposal, what would it have looked like from there? Let me ask about the idea of defining characteristics of movements today. You all have just toured the, the museum and you know the issues that were presented that created those, the, the movement of yesteryear. What do you think are the defining characteristics and how can leaders in this room participate? Mark, let me ask that to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that strikes me about movements is that everyone participates. Um, it, when you're in a movement, when you're in a movement moment, um, everyone has a pathway to being engaged. Um, someone can tweet, someone can protest, someone can, uh, you know, boycott. Uh, everyone can participate. And I think that really is the defining characteristic of a movement is that everyone is engaged in a way that is furthering the shared goal. Um, when I think about the, the, the tour we just went on, um, to me, that was one of the things that stood out. You know, you, everyday people were contributing in ways that were uh, small but really powerful, um, that, that were all in alignment with the, the goal, the objective, um, and, and that, that's, to me, the, the high water mark. Uh, we haven't been able to recreate that in many instances, and I think that um, when we are thinking about the next iteration of the civil rights movement or where we go from here, um, we have to create a condition that allows for everybody to engage. And so, Swin, um, how, how do you think we can effectively engage millennials as advocates and activists in this fight for social uh, justice? Well, one thing I think is to corner them on <laughs> history. <laughs> um, a lot of times, uh, there's so many, like you said, distractions, things that could happen. And um, millennials work hard. Like, they, they want, they're looking for jobs. Some are graduating out of college and have this huge debt. There's a lot of different things that are kind of weighing um, on this generation. And I think um, by letting them know what the past was like and how they could play a part in the future um, and hear them. A lot of times we're trying to talk down and talk to them instead of getting ideas and bringing them in as part of the conversation. Um, I'm a 
big believer in people having dialogue. I think across um, race, um, economics, everything, I think because we learn so much. For me, uh, one of my closest friends, Sue Bird, I played with her, we roomed together in college. We learned so much about each other coming from two completely different worlds. And I mean that literally, whereas she didn't realize kind of my upbringing and what it was truly like until we started talking and forced into that um, being roommates in college and learning how to break bread and talk to each other about our upbringings and about life, what we want. And she came to see my son and we were sitting there and we started talking about what was happening in the world and friends of ours and people we needed to connect with and how we could make change and why we needed to stay up on the news and things that were happening. And I think that's how you do it. You start having those conversations in your home, start having them with millennials, people in your neighborhood, and then you go out and everybody else starts planting seeds. Uh, that's the way we can make a huge impact. We have people like on this panel that may have bigger platforms, but every single person in here has a small, small platform that you can use, whether it's in your family or in your neighborhood. You know, millennials are actually getting kind of old now. <laughs> so we really do have to focus on, I think it's called Gen Z, um, that next generation. And, and I have to say that I'm quite encouraged by what I see with young people because, you know, you said sometimes you got to call it as you see it and they are willing to call it as they see it. So I'm actually quite encouraged. <laughs> I want to go back really quickly, though, because I do want to go back to, you know, we're talking about this, this theme. Where do we go from here? And Dr. King's book, um, Where Do We Go From Here? And what he was kind of imploring us. And so it's important to recognize that when King came to Memphis, he really was on a mission to lead the Poor People's Campaign. And he saw Memphis as a way to illustrate what he wanted to accomplish when it came to injustice of poverty. And he talked about uh, poverty against this landscape of capitalism and militarism. And you mentioned Reverend Barber, William Barber out of North Carolina, who is reviving a poor people's campaign to launch on Mother's Day of this year. Mark, I want you to talk a little bit about how you would compare the two, though. The poor people's campaign that it kind of got started, but kind of, you know, didn't make it for obvious reasons, and what the possibilities are now, because frankly, the issue of economic equity is an urgent one. It is. Um, and so, so how would you compare the two? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, 67, 68 was when the first one was being organized. Um, and, and shortly after uh, Dr. King was assassinated, um, it kind of petered out. I think it was around for another year and then petered out. And then what you see is a great backlash um, to that uh, in the ensuing years. Um, with you know trickle down economics um, and and uh, the 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 you know deepening of urban poverty um, and now I think you know people are at a moment where um, they are are, are fed up um, and and the, we're at the proverbial fork in the road um, as a country and I think um, there's a whole lot of momentum um, towards. Uh, a more just society that I think is just very clear and apparent. I think there are um, outbursts that we're seeing um, all over the country that are in opposition to that movement, but I think those are um, the last gasp. And I really feel like we're at a moment where there's energy and momentum moving in a direction of you know, a more just society. And so this campaign I think is uh, gonna endure in a way that is transformative. Um, I think about the work our organization has done for 20 years, we've been defining what equity is and, and forcefully advocating for that across the country. People are hungry for it. Um, our conferences in April in Chicago were sold out <laughs> three months in advance because people are eager to engage and, and to have a conversation. And so I think that the, 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 the difference will be um, that people will rise up like never before um, and they will stand united in a way that I think really um, takes us in a direction that is decidedly different from where we are now. Because you're right, um, the, the issue of economic equity is an urgent one. Um, we've had a disastrous tax bill uh, passed um, which will do nothing but, you know, make it harder for everybody ultimately um, deepen our entire country's debt. 
um, and really tilt the scales to, towards the 1%. And so I think that um, people are seeing that and are actively uh, calling it out and wanting to join arms and create an alternate future. Okay. I want to move to philanthropy because Dr. King actually spoke about philanthropy. He said, philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstance of economic injustice which make philanthropy necessary. Each of you are a philanthropist in your own right. And I talk about philanthropy as not just being your treasure, but your time and your talent as well. I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about how you put your resource to work for the community and how you kind of view philanthropy as activism. So Mike, let me start with you. Yeah, um, well I definitely, uh, you know, as an athlete uh, with the platform that we have, I think that um, you first start giving your time, your money and in, into different charities and you get involved in different things and then you realize that you know, your money isn't all that's gonna help the the cause that you're doing that you're that you're involved in and the more and more you're you're in the you're in the neighborhoods building homes you're um you know you're out in in playgrounds helping build play playgrounds for for communities and you realize all of a sudden that you are actively you know taking part in change uh, for a smaller portion for your micro economy your communities you're 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 making a difference uh, for me i i donated a million to a million dollars to the grizzlies foundation um, when, I, yeah, when I signed my contract um, two, two, season, two summers ago um, and in part to a mentorship program in which uh, allows all the kids um, who need one or, or want a, a mentor the opportunity to have one. And ultimately, you know, I, I just wanted to try to bridge that gap that we have right now to because I feel that mentors are, are very, very much uh, a necessity to get you on a path uh, of success in order to uh, achieve whatever goal you want to achieve. Brooke? Yeah, um, I mean, well, Mike said with mentors, uh, and I know I keep coming back to my mom, but I'm, you know, she's the reason I'm here today. You know, I mean, she's that foundation I talk about, you know, and um, is everything to me. But growing up for me, uh, she, she allowed me to, not just do basketball because I was tall, but, but try everything, be creative. Uh, she, she enticed me to read a lot, draw, write, and just be a creative person. And so I tried to give that uh, same sort of um, idea, idea back to the community in Fresno, where I'm from. And so you mentioned that uh, growing up, I was part of the Police Athletic League in Fresno. And that was a very special place in my heart to me. It took place in West Fresno, which is a, a less privileged area in Fresno. Um, and so I, uh, I try to go back every year and uh, give backpacks out to the students full of school supplies, reading, writing utensils, and do uh, book drives as well, where we give kids books and, and, and try to help build that foundation of creativity where they can find like maybe, they, maybe that their foundation, the scholarship and scholastic achievement isn't in athletics, but in some creative endeavor where they can get a scholarship, like I said, in, in some, some writing or or artistic endeavor, whatever it may be, they, they have that foundation and they have that chance to go out there and find that creative desire, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you spoke of, and I'm gonna tell you, every mother in this room is saying, I sure hope my child gets on stage one day and says, <laughs> they are who they are because of who I was and what I did for them. So your mother should be very proud. But you know, I think sometimes mentorship uh, mentoring kind of gets this kind of bad rap because people think, oh, well, you just go volunteer an hour. And But each of us in this room had a mentor. Maybe we didn't call them that, but there was somebody in our life that made a huge difference to us. And so I think it's very commendable to, to invest in mentorship and have someone who is committed to a child because, you know, let's face facts, you know, we hope that young people will be around a pay for us to be able to survive in the future, right? So um, I, I think that that is very commendable. Swin, can you talk a little bit maybe about your uh, philanthropic efforts as well? Yeah, so um, I look at the things that I do from a philanthropy standpoint, from a two-prong. Um, I, I love the things that I, I do with, with the MBA and MBA Cares. Um, just having an opportunity to 
kind of travel not only around the country but uh, around the world and be able to use the sport of basketball to embrace young people, to get their ideas, their creativity, um, and letting them know their opportunities, not just playing the game, but also behind the scenes. Um, and I've been able to take some of those key learnings from those opportunities to my own nonprofit with Cash for Kids. And what we try to do is um, help kids in the neighborhood where I grew up at in Western Pennsylvania, McKeesport, um, Pittsburgh area. We try to help the kids through sports. Um, nowadays, so many sports and activities, these kids have to pay $500 for this, $1,000 for that. Before growing up for me, cut the milk carton open and you put it over there with a basketball and sometimes that's how we played until we got the hoop back up. Um, and so I've tried to take away what parents um, any excuse the parents have of not signing their kids up or keeping them active. So creating a safe haven through sports um, is one thing that I've done. And also I created a couple of years ago our cultural trips. And basically what we do is we take the kids out of the neighborhood and we've taken them to D.C., we've taken them to Washington, I mean to D.C., we've taken them to New York and take them on cultural trips where they go to museums. They meet different, whether it's somebody in business, someone in finance, someone in sports, and we introduce them to new people. And we use some of the parents, sometimes as volunteers. And I'll never forget taking a mom to DC and she came knocking on my room door and she was crying and I, she just wanted to talk and I was talking to her and she said, this is the first trip that I've ever left out of the neighborhood. And I just thank you and I appreciate it so much. And it was just her first time seeing something else with her child. And for me, I think it's so important because when I was younger, my mom got me involved in sports and she made me go and travel all these different places for one reason alone, so that I can imagine and I can dream and I can see the other places and where I could be. And so I remember at 13 reading about Paris and at 14 on a basketball travel, traveling team going to Paris, having no clue like what is going on. I see black people, but they're speaking a different language and it's not like me and what's happening. And it just opened my mind up to the possibilities of what I could be or what I could achieve. And that's what I try to do with, with my nonprofit is plant those seeds. And sometimes that seed is just a hug to a kid that can't believe that I'm in the gym right there and they see these banners up um, that my mom, for some reason, like you, Brooke, has just put up there and you're like, Mom, why are you putting this up there? These kids don't need to know they need to see me. But um, yeah, that's, that's what I try to do. Just, just reach out and just touch somebody. Well. Where do we go from here? Clearly, as the panel has described, we go forward. And we continue to press on to meet the needs, but do it with some urgency, because we frankly don't have another 50 years uh, to, to try to fix some of the things that aren't sitting right today. So please join me in thanking our panel. I thank each of you for being here with us this evening. Now I'm gonna ask that you do me a favor, that you allow the panel to go across the street to where the um, uh, reception is first. So let them head on out the door first and then you can join them. But again, thank you panelists for uh, being with us this evening. <laughs>